e kamana e kareo e rai rangatirama tēnā koutou. E whare e tū nei tēnā koe, te papa e wako tēnā koe, ki e te whānau e hui hui nei tēnā koutou katoa. Ko ai o, nō kōtiranga me airani me ingarangi o kūtipuna, e tipu ake o ki ōtautahi, e noho ana o ki ōtiputi, ko Trish Priest tōko ingoa, ko te manakura o te wāhaka mātua mātou haora, te whariwanaha o Aotearoa, oh sorry, o Otaho Ahoi. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou, tātou, katoa. Welcome to Professor Tony Wall's inaugural professorial lecture. I feel that on this occasion, um, given our relatively informal um, society, it's important to say the words Professor Tony Walls as often as possible <laughs> in this speech. <laughs> um, attending inaugural professorial lectures is one of the enormous pleasures of this job. Um, I probably didn't say it in English. I'm Trish Priest, the acting, acting Pro Vice Chancellor Health Sciences um, for the University of Otago. Um, so I get to go to a lot of IPLs, and it's always a wonderful experience. Um, you get to know a bit more about some of your colleagues, and always um, learn lots of interesting things and hear an interesting story about their journey. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here in Christchurch for this IPL. And um, you can see I'm joined by some of my senior colleagues, which just helps to acknowledge um, how important this promotion is and how much we think it's important to um, note this moment. So it's my role to welcome you all to this special event where we celebrate Professor Wall's achievements and the people who supported him through his academic journey. Um, I want to especially welcome his wife Sarah Talbot, son Fraser, his mother Heather Walls and mother-in-law Suzanne Talbot. Um, I think there's other friends and family here whose names I don't know, so welcome to all of you and welcome to people who are either watching online or watching the recording later. Becoming a professor is the pinnacle of the academic journey. It requires creativity, commitment, perseverance to achieve at the required level to be promoted. And it's particularly impressive when it's done by somebody who also has a clinical job. Um, so we really, I'm really impressed with uh, all of those characteristics that Tony has demonstrate, demonstrated alongside being a busy clinician. I'm really looking forward to his inaugural professorial lecture. And I'll now pass on to the Dean, Professor Suze Pitama, to provide an introduction to Professor Walls. Thanks. Uh, kia ora koutou, ka mihi mahane kia koutou i tēnei wā. Isn't this so exciting? It's actually, I think, your professorial is like, it's, this is Tony's last exam. <laughs> and I think that isn't this a nice occasion to come together with Tony for his last exam. Um, I feel like the academic um, institution is, uh, a, has a long hazing process. It's like going to a boarding school, you can't escape. But tonight, Tony, we promise is your last hazing. Uh, I did promise Tony that I would not share any inappropriate or dodgy stories, so this is going to be a very short introduction. Um, uh, Tony started here in March 2010, which feels like time and memorial ago now, um, but I've had the real privilege, I have a privilege of Dean as being, um, Tony as the Head of Department of Paediatrics of being his line manager, so we get to talk about fun things like HR and money and finances, so hold on to your hats for that. But actually the more fun stuff that I've uh, had uh, the pleasure of working alongside Tony um, is actually as a colleague and he has such a passion for social accountability and he uh, every year uh, puts up his hands to uh, go with uh, our team into the Kura Kaupapa and Māori Immersion Schools and where we offer free paediatric screening with our fifth year students. And uh, it's such a privilege to see Tony, um, I get, I think this amazing glimpse of not just what an amazing clinician he is, what an amazing academic he is, but also what an amazing role model he is around the importance of social accountability and health equity. 
And uh, so um, I was going to email all his colleagues and ask them for dodgy stories, but given that this is a grown up event, um, the, the, I thought of a whakatauki, which is a Māori proverbial saying, which was um, coined by uh, the late Kingi Ihaka, that says, Hū tia te rito te harakeke, kei he te kora, te kore, sorry, te kore mako e ko, ka arere ki uta, ka arere ki tai, ki mai koe ki a hau, he aha teme nui i te ao, māku e ki atu, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. So many of you be familiar with the end bit of it, it's on some good ads and marketing campaigns, but I really wanted to focus on the front end of that whakatauki, which says, if you pluck the centre of the flax shoot, so the uh, centre bit of the harakeke, where will the bell birds sing? And uh, how we easily uh, have to then search and seek for where is safe. And I think that this, um, is very, this analogy of the harakeke bush is really key and explains to me a lot about the characteristics of Tony and that the uh, centre of the harakeke represents our children and our upcoming generation, and then the withered leaves around the outside represent us, Tony. Uh, <laughs> that we've, um, and our job is to buffer, um, to buffer the winds and the storms to keep the inner shoots uh, safe. And I think Tony's work in infectious diseases especially, and in his drive to be not just an amazing paediatrician, but amazing paediatric researcher, really well personifies that. So it's with great pleasure and an honour that I meet Professor Tony Walls to the stand. Kia ora koutou. Tēnā koe, Suze. It's a pleasure to be here tonight with you all. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. It's nice to have the family here. It's nice to have my colleagues from work and... Uh, and have you all here is really special. I'm kind of not a let's make a fuss kind of guy, I think, and so this will be fairly informal. Um, it feels a bit odd to me to be having all the fuss made, but in, in the end I kind of went with, it's actually quite nice, and you've worked hard, and so I'm just going to lean into it, and we'll, um, I, I'm, I just thought I'd uh, take it as it comes. So thank you all for being here. I, um, I wanted to start with the slide about the, the 50th anniversary of uh, University of Otago Christchurch because I this is where kind of I grew up as a, as a med student. I remember sitting I think over up there on my fifth year exams uh, right behind a colleague uh, Richard Matsis, who's one of the paediatricians up north, and we all got the same result. I don't actually know how that worked out. I was behind him, but anyway, you'll read into that what you want. Um, so I kind of, there's no, there's no names carved on the desks or anything like, because we're all very civilised, but it was, it was nice to, it's nice to be doing that here. And I spent a few years away before coming back uh, to Christchurch, and it was, it was great to be able to do so. I need to reflect on uh, the, the, the previous professors in paediatrics who have come before me, most, most of which I've either met or known. Uh, I think I'm the fifth. There was uh, Fred Shannon first, David Teal, who was infectious diseases specialist. So he was important to me because then I knew they existed. Uh, and lastly, there's been Brian Darlow and Andrew Day, both of which have had a, a really, I guess, reflecting on it, big effect on my career. Uh, Brian, uh, I guess, recruited me to my first job here, which was great, but I remember further back when I was a student, he was, he was the guy who was leading the research in paediatrics, he was the, the main researcher in paediatrics and really someone that I looked up to, so it's great to, uh, I think Brian might be online, so uh, if you are there, Brian, um, I really appreciate your input on those early years. And then Professor Andrew Day, who, who I followed around the world, really. I, he might have thought at times that I was stalking him, because uh, he was, when I was a, a, a newbie registrar, first year registrar, Andrew was my senior reg. And, uh, and then we both disappeared to various places, but I ended up following him to Sydney Children's Hospital uh, and worked there for two of their years. Then he came here, and about a year or so afterwards, I followed Andrew here, 
and then I followed him at the job of head of department, so I don't know what he thinks of all that, but um, mm -hmm. uh, I really appreciate Andrew's leadership along the way and, and, and leading the way forward for me. So it's, and, it, and it does feel a bit odd standing up here in that same role with those two gentlemen, um, and it's a bit hard to sink in at times that I might be there. The university gives you kind of a wide open, no remit really as to what to talk about, which I thought was quite brave, which is good of them, but um, I, I thought what I'd do tonight is perhaps just reflect on some of the research work that I've done. Uh, and when you're, when you're a fifth year student, I can absolutely guarantee that I wasn't sitting there thinking I want to make a difference. I was thinking what's happening Friday night and what's happening with the footy on the weekend or the cricket, depending on what season it was. I certainly wasn't thinking about making a difference. But as, you're, as you go through, you reflect, and you, I guess I ref building up to this, you reflect on the bits that have been important to you and of value. And it's always been something, when you look back, things that have made a difference in children's lives or their, or their families' lives have been, in terms of research content, the stuff that I've really enjoyed and the stuff that I think is important. So I'll touch on a couple of things with that. Uh, and I also want to, uh, I'll touch on the title of this talk, which was Research for Children Aotearoa, which is our new research platform, which was kind of looking forward and what were the, the difference that we would like to make going forward. So as Sue said, I'm an infectious diseases specialist. <laughs> sometimes we know where infections come from, sometimes we don't in children. Um, and I think if you had to have one slide summing up my job, it's probably this one. Um, <laughs> I th I'm one of those annoying people who think I've got the best job in the world. You know, I, I do all this university stuff, but I also have all this time working with children. Um, recently, one of my colleagues, Dawn Elder, retired, and she had a, something in the papers, uh, in, in the university um, newsletter, or whatever it was. And I think, and I, I hope I'm not misquoting Dawn, uh, she said something along the lines of, one day she was on a ward round with a professor of paediatrics and a, a small child kicked him in the stomach and she thought, this job's for me. And I could really relate to that, to be fair. Working, working with the little ones is just an enormous privilege. They're unpredictable, they are energetic, they're brutally honest, they are crazy, they're all that sort of stuff. And that's the fun, man. That's the stuff that is really, really good. So I'm incredibly lucky. Sometimes I'll say to mums and dads, you know, what's your role, what's your job? And I'll say, well, I'm an infectious diseases specialist for, for children. And you get these weird looks. Oh, yeah. What's that all about? Why would anyone want to do that? That's a bit bizarre. And in reality, I'm not kind of sure. There wasn't any sort of any big time when I sort of decided that's what I was going to do. I suppose, suppose there was, but I can't really recall. But you go back through sort of family records and stuff, looking for things, and... and Maybe there was a moment where perhaps, <laughs> perhaps infectious diseases came into my life. So the mumps vaccine didn't arrive in New Zealand until 1990, but here's me clearly with the mumps a little bit before that. I won't tell you how long before that. And may, you know, maybe this is the moment. This is the time an infectious diseases came to, to me and became... I guess if you were looking at this and thinking of future careers, there's a couple you'd probably cut off. Fashion would probably be off. <laughs> Hairdresser, clearly out. <laughs> the, the lady responsible for the haircut sitting over there. <laughs> but, but I think we'll let her off because uh, number five in the chain, and, and to be fair, I'm pretty wiggly, I remember, not really enthused about haircuts. So in those days, you just got what you get. Thank you very much. Move on. Um, but it does make me reflect on how lucky I've been. And growing up in a house, I was a couple of school teachers and loads of older brothers and sisters. And, you know, that environment probably set, you know, paediatricians know, talk all the time about the first thousand days of a child's life. And I, you know, I had it pretty good. Well, we didn't have top of the range tricycles, clearly. <laughs> but... But there was everything else you need there. There was plenty of books. There was all sorts of stuff going on. We were well provided to. So I was pretty lucky. The other story is the bloke who's taking this photograph. So my dad's no longer with us. He didn't see me get to med school. But you can guarantee he had a twinkle in his eye when he was taking this photo. <laughs> you can guarantee. 
Come on, Tony, let's get you outside. It's a lovely day, we'll get a photograph, because he knew that this is the sort of thing that's going to turn up later in life, yeah? So, he knew. And, and again, uh, I, um, I can't talk about too much, but it, it, it's just, a, he was a wonderful role model for me. So, uh, really, really lucky in all those aspects. So, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, immunisations tonight. I'm going to start with whooping cough and go through the history of that in Canterbury, because it is a little bit unique. And, and talk specifically about preventing whooping cough with vaccines, and that's all about vaccinating pregnant women. Now, the next slide is uh, perhaps disturbing to people, but that's the reality. Whooping cough is a scary disease for the little ones. I always kind of say to students that this is the one that probably scares me the most because this is the one that, as doctors, we can't do anything about, and these little babies cough and cough and cough until they go blue, and it's, and it's, you know, it's an awful thing to see. I, I toyed with putting a video out there, but it's actually too distressing to watch a video of a baby coughing like this. So it's something that we really need to be working hard on to prevent in this country. And some of you will be may, may be aware that just recently, uh, just this year, there's been a number of deaths from whooping cough, which we haven't seen for a number of years in New Zealand, all related to uh, um, disease spreading in the community without us knowing, and in each case, the mum hadn't been vaccinated and these were young babies who unfortunately ended up in the ICU and died. And there's been more and more cases coming through. And talking to some colleagues from Auckland last week, uh, in some of these cases, these babies, they went and tested the whole farm out and found that pretty much everyone had whooping cough that was close to this baby. So these are, these are preventable deaths and, and, and pretty sad. And here's the, here's the kind of theory as to why babies are most at risk. So in, those, in the middle years, you see here, we vaccinate, when we do it well, we vaccinate well, and so infants are protected against whooping cough through their school years, they're protected, we give them a booster when they're 11, so in the, that purple box, everything's good. But we don't vaccinate after that, and so naturally, whooping cough immunity wanes. Your protection against whooping cough wanes, so that by the time you are of an age when you're having your own children, the chance of you having effective protection against whooping cough is pretty slim. So when a baby comes into the house, they are at risk if the older family members get whooping cough out in the community. And there's a lot of spread that we don't understand in the community and adults and young people because they're distant from their immunizations. And so that's the, that's the risk for babies. And of course, vaccinating mum during pregnancy gets around that um, by providing antibodies for baby before they're born. And just to illustrate the difficulties with this, if this is data from the UK, just before they started vaccinating women against whooping cough. If you look at the, uh, along the bottom, there's the weeks of the year, the total number of cases along the left. And the, uh, you can see there that there are three doses of whooping cough vaccine given to infants from about eight or nine weeks of age, from eight weeks, it takes a couple of weeks to start working. And after one dose, there's fewer cases. After two doses, fewer cases. After three doses, they're pretty much all gone. But you can see in the grey bars there, the unimmunised children, the children that are too young to get whooping cough vaccine. And these are the cases who are coming in hospital. And the, the, the cruel reality is that the younger you are, the worse your whooping cough's going to be. And so there's, there's, there's this big gap in those first two or three months where children are little babies are potentially uh, unprotected against whooping cough and we've been unable to protect them. So this is 2011-2012 in the UK. We had a similar sort of thing going on in New Zealand at that time and we made the choice, and Professor Murdoch was involved in all that, uh, uh, to go ahead to start using whooping cough vaccine during pregnancy for the first time in New Zealand. Canterbury was one of the first places to do that in the country. And... Um, it was really because, and it, the context of all this is that no one had been vaccinating pregnant women prior to this in New Zealand. It was a new concept. It was a little bit scary, perhaps. And, uh, but there were, there, were, there were babies dying of whooping cough in the community, and we had to do something. And we thought that this was going to be an effective method for protecting those infants in the first few months of life. And sometimes we think back and people think that, that this was all new. It was all, you know, we're giving this vaccine in pregnancy. No one's ever done this before, but it's just not true because around the world, for more than a decade, people have been vaccinating pregnant women 
with almost a, an identical vaccine, just without the whooping cough component to protect against maternal and neonatal uh, tetanus around the world. So vaccinating, if we look to other parts of the world, uh, we could see that uh, vaccinating pregnant women wasn't new and wasn't scary. But the reality is it still was. So, so uh, I was fortunate to be given a grant to do some work around um, vaccinating pregnant women and we did a, a study. So, so we did a prospective study of um, the infants and the baby uh, and the women who uh, were given Tdap, the, the, the tetanus diphtheria A cellular pertussis vaccine for the first time during pregnancy. Followed them from the time they received the vaccine with close monitoring. After the birth, saw the baby and followed the babies through to, most of them, through to 12 months of life. And the great thing was there weren't any adverse effects found from that vaccine. And at the time, that was very reassuring. And uh, to this date, this, this remains the biggest study of individual follow-up of babies who have been exposed to the vaccine during pregnancy because most of the other work that's been subs done subsequently has been, um, has been large cohorts and observations following that way. What's valuable for me in this, and the, the bit that well, I look back on and think was great, is the fact that we integrated this into clinical care. So we, uh, remarkably, we got a grant from the DHB, which is probably the most remarkable thing of all that we won't see <laughs> nowadays. But it was, it was basically, we, this was business as usual, but we were doing research along the way. And I think that's what we need to be doing a lot more of, trying to uh, integrate the research that we're doing uh, whenever we're doing new interventions like this. Subsequently, we found out that it really works. You know, the data from the UK where they introduced it really early on showed that at least the 90% protection stopping babies under three months of age being admitted to hospital with whooping cough. This is, a, this is a, a great vaccine to be using. It's very effective uh, and everyone should be getting it who's pregnant. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. All right? So you can have a great vaccine, but until it makes it into someone's arm, it's of no use. So we haven't done as well as we would like. This is data from uh, Nikki Turner's group uh, published earlier this year and showing the uh, overall coverage of pregnant women across the country. You can see the dotted line is the average. We've, we've never made it to 50% of women getting hoop and cough vaccine during pregnancy. Canterbury's actually done a little bit better than, than most other regions around the country, and it's probably something to do with um, uh, our excellent sort of uh, primary care networks that, that have taken this on board. But other places not so well, and you can see that this is really, uh, in my view, a bit of a failure of, of the Ministry of Health and the government in terms of getting this done. So it's a bit disappointing. Uh, they've especially been failing to reach Māori and Pacific communities, which is, which is obviously not what we would like. And, you know, there's going to be lots of reasons why this happened. The, the actual, we've only gone up to 2021 here, but you can see, uh, but actually later on it's, it's possibly dropped off again post-COVID. So we need to do better. And it's all very well to have a, a great vaccine, one that you think is safe, one that you think works, but if we're not achieving that, not getting it done, then that's not quite as good as it should be. Uh, in 2017, as things were going upwards, health targets were essentially removed uh, and uh, no one was being held accountable to health targets on immunisations, which I think is a real shame. And I guess if I had one wish nowadays, it would be that we reintroduce some targets and double our efforts to make sure that for this vaccine in particular, given what's going on in our community, that we're really getting it out to the people who really need it. So I don't want to be a downer the entire time. You can't get away without a, um, a COVID mention in an infectious diseases talk, but you're safe, I'm not going to talk about it too much. The purpose of talking about COVID is really to remember back to how we all learnt the word epidemiologist, if you didn't know it already, during COVID, yeah? They suddenly became the kings. They were the ones who were making the newspapers um, and uh, it was all about epidemiology. I kind of, and some of you who have heard me talk on COVID will understand that I don't necessarily agree with lots of the stuff that's published and stuff about epidemiology and I won't go into that, but um, 
uh, I, I guess I consider myself an amateur epidemiologist as many, much of the work that I've been doing is related to epidemiology, but I, I usually recruit some experts whenever I'm doing it. Um, I'm going to talk about this bug. I'm going to talk, this is a bacteria, this is Streptococcus pneumoniae, really common bacteria that you isolate in the, the, the nasopharynx of, of children, um, but it can, uh, causes disease in adults as well. Really common cause of ear infections, acute otitis media. Uh, pneumonia, common cause of pneumonia in the past before we had vaccinations. And these, these are kind of referred to not as invasive disease for some reason. They can be severe, they can be troubling for children, they can obviously be very, very painful at times for children, but they're not, not the worst of the spectrum of disease. We talk about invasive pneumococcal disease, which is where, but in, in my you know, experiences, the babies and children become sick with either blood poisoning or meningitis or um, other presentations with septic shock and those sort of things. So that's what we talk about when we talk about invasive pneumococcal disease. And when we, when we follow, this is a vaccine preventable disease, and when we follow the epidemiology of all this, we, we don't follow all the children with ear infections or with pneumonia and things, because that's really challenging and difficult to record, and there's some difficulties with classification. But what we follow is this invasive pneumococcal disease, and it's kind of the tip of the iceberg. It's the bit that we see, the severe stuff in hospital, but we know there's a whole lot of other stuff going on in the background as well. And we have a number of conjugate vaccines that we use against invasive pneumococcal disease, or pneumococcal disease, but we particularly against invasive pneumococcal disease. The numbers here represent serotypes. Now, you don't need to know all about the serotypes. All you need to know is we started with seven, and then a couple of other options were added on. It all had the same ones, but they had some added ones. So the 10-valent vaccine has three additional ones. The 13-valent vaccine has three additional ones. And those are all the serogroups. There are more than 100 sero serotypes, I should say. There's more than 100, and we just cover the ones that are, are kind of most common in the community. We started with the seven valent one, but that was unavailable in 2011. Then we were left with uh, sort of two separate choices. Uh, and that's what came down to, Pharmac made the choices about moving to which vaccine next, uh, and uh, which was gonna be the most appropriate for the community. At, at the time when we first brought these in, uh, we all thought they're all about the same. Pick one, doesn't matter which one, they'll do the job, it's all good. Uh, and that's what they did. But we also realised that there was one serotype, one called 19A, which I'm going to talk about today, which could potentially be a problem for the community. And we, we, we kind of, I think, my recollection is we made a note to say we need to watch the epidemiology of this serotype in case it becomes a problem. And in other countries in the world, it did become a problem. All right, so here's some data just showing the three serotypes that are in the 13 vaccine, not the 10. And two countries in South America who had used the 10 valent vaccine and suddenly there was what we call serotype replacement where the vaccine's not covering this 19A and it becomes a predominant serotype causing invasive pneumococcal disease in those communities. And then you can see a pretty clear relationship in both Brazil in 2013 uh, and Colombia, which took a couple of years, but the numbers of cases of this 19A serotype are uh, going up and up and up. And of course, that's what happened in New Zealand. So this graph, I'll just take a little bit of time on. There are uh, the years along the bottom, the rate of 19A disease listed on the left. And this is by age group, the different colours and graphs, and the, the different periods with vaccination, uh, the background colours. So we started with a PCV10 vaccine, 2014 to seven, there was a change, Pharmac must have got a good deal, uh, and they changed to the PCV13. And then we're, we're one of the few countries in the world who did the swap back. And again, it's probably all came down to dollars and cents, and we got a good deal from the drug company, I'm sure, this is not something I know anything about because we're never told. Um, but I suspect that's what happened. Uh, and you can see if you look, uh, particularly in the children under two, the red bar, shortly after 2017, the rates started going up and up and up. 2001, they got quite high. We started to get alarmed. 2022, they got really high. The rates of this uh, kind of outbreak strain of invasive pneumococcal disease. And I, can, I haven't got the... the the graph for here for you for 2023 because it's 
not complete as yet, but I can tell you it's going up and up and up. And most of the disease that's happening uh, across the country in little ones is due to this 19A serotype that was not in the vaccine that we were using. I see Nanki's in, in the audience. She did some work uh, this year comparing what's happened in New Zealand, their experience with invasive pneumococcal disease, to what's happened in Australia. Now, in Australia, they used the 13-valent vaccine, a good one, all the way through. Uh, and if you look at, firstly, invasive pneumococcal disease for the under twos, you can see that up until 2020, we were about the same as Australia, but all of a sudden, we had higher rates of all invasive pneumococcal disease in children under two. The rates bumped up. And if you look at the 19A disease specifically, you can see the proportion of, out of infections that were causing in severe disease in children under two in New Zealand was suddenly due to this 19A strain that's not in our vaccine. So we all know by the time it makes its way to stuff that we're really in trouble. Uh, and this is what clinicians were noting around the country, that there was more invasive pneumococcal disease, more cases of sepsis, more cases of meningitis. And when, this, when the information comes back from a lab, you'd find that it was often this 19A strain. So it was pretty, uh, I guess, rewarding. We were pretty chuffed when, late last year, uh, Pharmac decided out of step from the cycle that they would normally do, and this probably cost them a fair bit of money, to be fair, to change, uh, under pressure from all sorts of places, but I hope that the work that we've done has kind of had some impact on that, they were able to change to the PCV13 vaccine. Now, just like with whooping cough, it's absolutely no use if you change it if the people aren't getting it, and we have all sorts of trouble with our immunisation coverage across the board at the moment, which I won't bore you with tonight. But in terms of epidemiology having an impact and making real changes that hopefully makes a big difference for our little ones, uh, this is something that uh, our group can be really proud of. So now I'm going to turn and talk about my favourite topic at the moment, which is research for children Aotearoa. This is a research collaborative that we set up around about this time last year, uh, right in this room. And it is unique in many ways. It, it's not just the University of Otago. Uh, it's across various institutions. When we set it up, we were, you know, I include myself, thinking more on health lines, but I need to acknowledge my co-director, Professor Gail Gillen, who's the director over at the um, Child Wellbeing Institute at the University of Canterbury. And she came to me and we, we sat down and thought, we, we need a broader approach. We need an approach to research that uh, not just focused on health, but focused on families, focused on the environment the children are growing up on, and focused on their well-being, and being uh, multidisciplinary and just getting out of our little silos in health and trying to extend that. So that's what we've tried to do. Just to give you an example of some of the collaborations that we've been developing, uh, you, many of you will be aware that the, the Youth Health Centre in Christchurch will be setting up shop next year sometime, hopefully midway through next year. And we've been having some preliminary discussions about integrating uh, research capacity with that community, talking to them about what they would like in terms of research development and uh, seeing if when they get off the ground, all the work that they're doing uh, is side by side with some clinical research as well from, from our team. I also met recently with the team from the South Island Health Alliance who are really keen with all the changes with Te Fata Water and the structural changes to ensure that when things are developed that actually there's a research component going alongside all the cl clinical components as they go on. So that's, that's an angle we're really, really pleased about. We're well supported by Te Papa Hauora. Now, uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, but that's, that's the, the health precinct. Um, and I see Peter and Piff up the back there, and I acknowledge their support and help with setting up their um, uh, research for children Aotearoa. I really like the metaphor that they use for, of uh, weaving everyone together in a group is one that we really, we really like. And so that, that relationship with us with them uh, is fantastic. They, they 
Uh, there's a lot of different groups involved in Te Papa Holder and, and so we want our research teams to be working across institutions, uh, having ideas flowing uh, with different teams and different disciplines and that's what we're working towards. Uh, just as a recent example, um, this is my PhD student Talia working at uh, Etu Pacifica which is the um, Pacific primary care practice just across the road in the health precinct. Uh, this was on Māori television last week and uh, this is a really good example of embedding uh, students and research in the community. So Talia is doing some work on uh, acute rheumatic fever and the experiences of children and young people with acute rheumatic fever and um, those of you who were at the Abbott Symposium recently, she, she, did, she did an excellent talk outlining how this was important to her family uh, and she's been working as a healthcare assistant at A2 Pacifica while she's doing her research uh, and that's a deliberate plan to uh, kind of embed the research in her community and make sure that she's well supported to be working there so we hope, I hope that's successful for her. I need to acknowledge Kiki Moati who's our Associate Dean Pacific who kind of gets that stuff underway as a senior leader in the, in the Pacific Medical Association, he kind of funds that job and he actually insisted that Talia be working and the people we've got through be working in the community in NATO Pacifica so that when they're doing that research it's really relevant to them. I think he was in the Cook Islands when he did this on Māori television. It looks very beachy. Anyway, so re we really appreciate uh, Kiki's support all the way through. The other thing with Research for Children Aotearoa is, is we want to be the fun guys, you know, we want research to be a lot of fun. So later in the year we've got planned the inaugural Research for Children Aotearoa Golf Day, which Viv is helping to organise, absolutely fantastic, at the beautiful Taitafu Golf Club. Um, uh, no ability required, I'd encourage, this is kind of an invitation, anyone who wants to come along and wants to meet the team, please come along and uh, hit a few golf balls. We might have to put some restrictions on those who actually know how to hit a golf ball uh, so that it's a, it's a fun event. Uh, and, and, and I think we may be the only research group that has its own golf ball. <laughs> I suspect most of them will end up in the river, but um, uh, maybe I've got that all wrong. So I, 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 I won't keep you too long. I just There's one more acknowledgement uh, I wanted to make, and that's... Uh, my lovely wife Sarah, who's sitting here today. Um, so this is all a journey, isn't it? And uh, uh, both a, a, a literal and figurative journey that you go on. This is us, oh God, 20 years ago, uh, when I was training in London, and I think this is Christmas uh, in Florence, where we ducked away to. We're hoping to do it all again sometime soon, but um, you know, this stuff doesn't happen if you don't have wonderful support at home. And I've thanked Sarah before, but I'm going to thank her public as well for for all those times that I've been, you know, on call, working hard, way overseas, all that drama, um, I, I could have done any of this without Sarah. So thank you, Sarah. I'm just going to finish with an invitation and a challenge. So the invitation is, if, if there's anyone out there who's watching this online or, or who uh, is here tonight who has an, uh, an interest in child health or wellbeing research, please come and talk to us. Uh, we want to be expanding, making connections, linking everyone together. The challenge I put out there is that we need to work hard to make this uh, a real entity, something with meaning, something that gets stuff done. We need to be working hard to be reaching out to other researchers. We need to break down silos. We need to be uh, changing the way we work. I guess it's kind of going back to that preschooler mentality where you're all full on and there's no restrictions and you it's all excitement that's what kind of what we're looking for and I'd like to think that over the coming years we can build this into something that really does some great work and hopefully has an impact on the lives of children and their families I really appreciate you guys sharing with me tonight uh, thank you all for coming Tihei Māori ora, uh, ina rangatira, ina ahurangi, ina uh, tawera, ina haumahi uh, tēnā koutou. 
e te kaikorero o tēnei pō, uh, ahurangi Tony Walls, uh, nga minui ki a koe. Uh, nō reira e hō mā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, my name is Tony Ballantyne and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor External Engagement for the University and I've come up to the, from Dunedin for this event. It's great to be here in Ōtutahi Christchurch and fantastic to be here this evening to hear uh, Professor Wall share his reflections on his research and his uh, uh, professional journey. These are very special occasions and I think we've heard a fantastic lecture this evening a lecture that's not only reflected on, on the trajectory of Tony's career, but I think on something that's very important, um, which is the power of collaboration and building connections. And I think that runs through uh, the, the kind of retrospective reflections he shared with us, but also the, the forward-looking uh, challenge and vision that he shared with us at the end. These occasions are very special because it is a chance for us to come together as a community to celebrate the outstanding achievements of one of our colleagues, to celebrate their uh, promotion to the highest rank that we have in the university and recognition of their excellence in teaching and research and clinical work and, and, and service. So, um, and of course, we've had a, a great uh, lecture this evening reflecting on, on Tony's work. More broadly, these are really important occasions because they celebrate those key aspects of what define the university, again, that teaching and research, but that um, commitment to making a difference in the world. And I think Tony's work really em embodies that spirit. So thank you for coming this evening. Thank you, Tony, for a, a great talk. And it's been very special having a good group of your family and friends here uh, in the room uh, this evening. So could I ask you to join me in a final round of applause for Tony, please? Thank you.